age over 65, female gender, ACS, vascular disease, um, and then angiographic features such as um, a total stent length, a thrombotic lesion length, other kind of variables and factors that would make someone more predisposed to bleeding. Um, so that was twilight. So we can see a bit of an interesting trend here. The shorter durations are being favored, both for stable coronary disease uh, and also um, for kind of some ACS, but not necessarily STEMI. Notably, STEMIs uh, are very underrepresented in these trial populations. So then moving on to kind of TICO, which is the last trial I'll present to provide the overview, it was published in JAMA in 2020. Uh, and this trial randomized 3,000 patients with ACS to either three months of DAPT with ASA and Ticargolor versus 12 months of um, aspirin ticagrelor. So the, the TICO trial um, wanted to have a more robust enrollment of purely ACS patients and kind of remove that signal from stable coronary disease. And the primary outcome here was major bleeding, death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, or target uh, lesion revascularization. So uh, unsurprisingly, um, the primary outcome was present 3.9% at the three month in the three month group and 5.9% in the 12 month group, indicating that there is overall lower incidence of a composite outcome of a bleeding death MI stent. So I think the takeaway from these trials was that you could go for a maybe shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, and reduce bleeding outcomes without sacrificing your ischemic or thrombotic outcomes for stents. So keeping this little overview in mind, I'd like to move on uh, to the STOP DAP2 ACS trial, which was presented by Dr. Hirotoshi Watanabe from Kyoto uh, of the STOP DAP2 uh, investigators uh, group. So in this trial, they, they took uh, uh, 4,169 patients who had PCI for ACS, and then they randomized them to DAP um, with Plavix for one month, and then Plavix monotherapy, uh, sorry, for uh, 12 months, and then ACE and Plavix for 12 months. So trial composition-wise, 56 patient percent of patients were STEMIs, so the highest enrollment of STEMIs of the DAPT trials, um, uh, looking at duration. Non-STEMIs were 20%, unstable angina 24%. So this graphic uh, is from PCR Online, and they've kind of summarized the relevant characteristics in a PICO format. So the primary outcome here was CV death, MI, stroke, stent thrombosis, TME major, and minor bleeding as a composite. Um, and the primary outcome was observed in 3.2% of the three-month arm and 2.8% in the 12-month arm. Now, interestingly enough here, uh, as we uh, delve into the uh, characteristics of the trial a little bit more, you'll notice that it didn't meet the non-inferiority margin um, for uh, significance. And there was a trend towards more bleeding uh, in the prolonged uh, DAPT arm, which again is consistent with observed data. But they did note that one month DAPT outcomes were worse if you look at the subgroups um, uh, with ASA and Plavix. So, you know, what is the bottom line and, and what, um, what does this kind of entail for our patient population? So, in ACS patients who undergo PCI uh, with uh, ASA and Plavix for one month, followed by Plavix monotherapy for 11 months when compared to 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy with ASA and Plavix, did not meet criteria for non inferiority with regards to a composite outcome of CV death, MI stroke, stent thrombosis. So, why is this discrepant from the other PTY12 trial, TICO, that was done with TICAG as an agent, um, and perhaps Twilight as well, which is not an, uh, a STEMI trial but did have ACS patients? was that perhaps a ticagrelor is a more potent uh, PTY12 inhibitor, and you can theoretically get away with a shorter duration of DAPT with a potent PTY12, but not a less potent PTY12 inhibitor um, such as Plavix. The other thing is this was primarily an East Asian population cohort, and the primary PTY12 inhibitor of choice was Plavix. And they were not routinely um, screened for uh, kind of metabolic insusceptibility um, uh, or less therapeutic effect of Plavix in that population. Um, so uh, I think consistently the takeaway from ADAPT trials is um, longer duration, more bleeding, less duration with a more potent agent. Uh, so one month of DAPT may be sufficient uh, in high bleeding risk patients. Um, I'd be very wary of doing only one month of DAPT with say Plavix as a PTY12. Perhaps in that context, you may want to consider Ticargolor. Um, the next trial, uh, again, in the same vein as the master DAPT trial, uh, which was published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. So um, this one, I think, was it was uh, published by an Italian group. A little bit interesting in terms of trial design, uh, perhaps we can discuss. 
So what they did was they um, took about 4,500 patients that had symptomatic coronary disease and high bleeding risk, again, i.e. one clinical or one angiographic risk factor uh, that uh, pr uh, predisposes towards higher bleeding, who underwent PCI and then had one month of dual antiplatelet therapy, and then they were randomized to an abbreviated dual antiplatelet therapy arm um, in which they stopped the second antiplatelet uh, immediately, so they'd completed one month, and then continued on a single antiplatelet agent. And standard DAPT, which is they had dual antiplatelet therapy for six months, and then they had single antiplatelet therapy. Trial composition, again, I think very important to consider. Stable coronary disease population, about half of the study, uh, and then ACS comprising um, uh, roughly about 38%. So, um, this is how they kind of formulated the trial. So they had their index PCI, they were at higher bleeding risk. The interesting thing here is that the um, one thing I, I think is very important to mention is that um, PCI was performed uh, with a, um, a biodegradable polymer serolimus eluding stent. Um, uh, and uh, the, the initial screening occurred, so index PCI, and then from 30 to 44 days is when they did the screening for the trial. Um, and uh, the median duration um, of dual antiplatelet therapy in the abbreviated arm was about 34 days or about a month uh, and 193 days in the standard therapy group. They pre-specified um, a ranked primary endpoint scheme uh, in which uh, they had net adverse clinical events uh, as the first. The second was major adverse cardiac and cerebral events and the third was major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So um, the way that's formulated, I'll kind of skip ahead here. Um, and in the outcomes, so these, this is what it is. So their net adverse clinical event refers to all-cause mortality, MI, stroke, major bleeding, uh, which met the mark for non-inferiority, so the abbreviated and standard arms. Uh, and then the major adverse cardiac and cerebral events, also non-inferior. Uh, but again, unsurprisingly, uh, bleeding um, was the shorter duration or abbreviated duration was superior with regards to um, clinically relevant major non-major bleeding. So what is the bottom line? Um, so in patients who undergo PCI with a biodegradable polymer serolimus eluding stent, uh, right, increased bleeding risk and abbreviated DAPT was not inferior to standard DAPT with regards to net adverse clinical events and major adverse cardiac or cerebral events. So, you know, a few issues with this trial. Um, I think they're using a single stent platform, one that's not really widely used. I think there's a threat to potential applicability of the data because this is a platform that is not widely used worldwide. Uh, and um, it was interesting that they had three kind of um, uh, ranked primary outcomes. Uh, but again, again, that's statistically sound, but I thought it was an interesting trial to kind of just show to kind of bookend the discussion on dual antiplatelet therapy regimens in uh, ACS and stable coronary disease. So moving on to kind of the next theme uh, is the Tomahawk trial, um, which is, uh, was titled Angi Angiography After Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Rest Without ST Segment Elevation. As you recall, a similar trial, COACT, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, but uh, Tomahawk, I think, expands the applicability of this particular uh, data and the group that were selected. So they were impressively able to enroll 554 patients over the age of 30 with resuscitated out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with no ST elevations on ECG, and they included um, patients with shockable and non-shockable rhythms. And then they were randomized to either immediate or delayed angiography. Um, the interesting thing about the patient cohort, so median age is about 70, uh, but I found this very interesting in, the, in table one, was that more than 85% had a witness cardiac uh, arrest but only 55% or so had bystander CPR. So perhaps an element of education to consider. Um, the other thing is more than half had a shockable first rhythm. So this is where the trial is a little bit different than COACT because COACT included people with shockable rhythms, whereas this trial included um, shockable and non-shockable rhythms in an approximately kind of 50-50 um, uh, percent kind of composition of study population. So the intervention um, was uh, immediate angiography, and then there's delayed angiography. So um, 
Now, the I think from an ethical perspective and ethics kind of um, discussion, uh, they did allow for angiography in the delayed angiography group in the following circumstances. So once the delayed angiography group went to the ICU or CCU, if there was further clinical examination, objective testing consistent with ischemia, then that patient was allowed uh, to be enrolled um, in the, uh, uh, basically was allowed to be sent for uh, angiography um, uh, with a minimum delay of 24 hours. But um, there were certain aspects uh, of the patient population that, for example, if the troponin uh, TNI or TNT was greater than 70 times the upper limit of normal, if the CK was greater than 10 times the upper limit of normal, if there's electrical instability thought to be from ischemia, or if there's cardiogenic shock or new ST elevations, they didn't have to make the minimum 24 hours. They could go within the 24-hour window. Uh, and from a revascularization perspective, they attempted to revask um, if at least one major artery disease that was deemed to be clinical, uh, clinically relevant, uh, and this was adjudicated by the provider uh, doing the procedure. And given uh, the pre-selected nature of the population and how sick they were post-arrest, PCI was favored over cabbage uh, whenever possible. So then, um, if you look at uh, the prevalence of, of kind of what happened in the immediate angiography and, and uh, delayed angiography group, uh, you'll see 95% of patients had immediate angiography uh, and uh, in the delayed group it was about 62%. Um, a significant femoral preponderance in terms of how they uh, pursued access um, and about 70% or so in the immediate group and 60%. Um, the distribution of coronary disease, roughly about, well, in the immediate angiography group, I think higher um, proportion of no substantial disease, oddly enough, um, and uh, at least a third of the patient population had multivessel disease. Um, so, what are the primary outcomes? Um, uh, so, there's only one, it was a very robust singular outcome, not a composite, death from any cause at 30 days. So in the immediate angiography arm, it was about 143 patients, or 54%, and the delayed angiography arm was 46%. So um, when they break down the primary outcome by subgroup, uh, as you can see, all of the point estimates have fairly broad confidence intervals and cross the line of unity, um, uh, and effectively indicating that patients who have resuscitated cardiac arrest with no ST elevations uh, a strategy of immediate and unselected coronary angiography provided no benefit over delayed and selective approach with respect to the primary endpoint of death from any cause. So again, these findings are pretty consistent with the COACT trial, although COACT only enrolled shockable rhythms. Uh, Tomahawk allows us to extend this to a broader spectrum of risk. So why did angiography show lack of benefit? So the percentage of patients that actually had a culprit lesion for the arrest was only about 40%. We're drowning out the therapeutic efficacy signal by unselectively taking all cumbers without ST elevations and cardiac arrest to the lab. Um, so what happens is you expose a population that would theoretically not benefit from PCI to a culprit lesion um, by exposing them to procedural risk and potentially delaying diagnosis of the true inciting event for the cardiac arrest. Um, and then the other thing is, if you look at the cardiac arrest population, uh, the benefit of CATH is attenuated because long-term wise, survival tends to hinge more on neurologic survival as opposed to cardiac survival. In the sense that a lot of these patients, depending on timing of clinical presentation, may have significant neurologic injury that um, does not favor um, significant recovery and ultimately is a cause of death. Um, so interesting insights, expands a little bit on existing literature. Um, and I think as a caution, um, we have to be careful in applying evidence in an algorithmic fashion. If, for example, a patient comes in and they have a history of preceding chest pain, cardiac risk factors, um, say there's elements of substantial troponin elevation and say not ischemic perhaps, but um, sorry, not ST elevations, but perhaps say ischemic ECG changes, I think you should give it a second thought uh, before saying that, you know, because of COACT and Tomahawk, there's no ST elevations, you know, take them to the CCU and uh, and just kind of manage um, in a non-invasive fashion. Um, I think there should be a allotment for um, clinical judgment uh, to be able to take patients that are deemed to be high risk uh, and, and not fall in the trap of the algorithmic application of evidence.
Um, so Ripcord True, uh, sorry, Ripcord Two is a trial that was published by, uh, sorry, presented by Dr. Uh, Nicholas Curzon at ESC 2021, not yet published. Um, a bit of an interesting trial. Um, I thought I would put this here um, uh, with Dr. Chong's guidance just to perhaps spark a little bit of debate. Um, this slide, uh, this uh, graphic is from PCR Online. So this is a trial that took about 1,100 patients in 17 UK centres. Uh, and these patients were about to go angiography for chest pain or non-STEMI. Um, and what they did was, if there was, uh, in any vessel, if there was an epicardial stenosis of more than 30%, and the vessel was uh, 2.25 millimeters in size, i.e. suitable for PCI or um, surgical revascularization, FFR was kind of uh, indiscriminately performed. Um, and then the manage plan, management plan was according to angiography and FFR. The control was just angiography alone, and the management was decided um, on just the angiographic data. Um, and then the primary outcome was a, a, a co-primary of total hospital cost or quality of life. And then as a secondary outcome, they looked at major adverse cardiac events. Um, and then there was a one-year follow-up for both. So, um, interesting findings uh, with the crow primary outcome. So with regards to total hospital costs, it was about the same, whether you FFR in all these vessels or not. And then quality of life was also no different. Um, further tests were requested in about 15% of the angiographic guidance group alone uh, versus about 2% in the systemic FFR group. Um, so patients that had kind of indiscriminate FFR in all vessels with lesions over 30 percent uh, basically had longer procedures, more contrast and more radiation. Um, and the systemic FFR group was associated with a complication rate of 1.8 percent. So what does this mean? Um, there's no benefit in terms of resource utilization, quality of life or clinical outcomes at one year from a systemic utilization perspective of FFR in patients that are undergoing diagnostic angiography. If you look at the patient population, um, I mean, the trial hasn't been published, so I wasn't able to look at all the data, uh, but overall the population had low complexity of disease, uh, indiscriminate use of physiology would have a lower impact in say, a, a population group that has more severe visually uh, significant angiographic stenosis and say true multivessel disease. Um, and the fact that investigators selected patients with any visual stenosis over 30%, um, it makes it highly unlikely that uh, lesions of this severity would truly affect um, or cause ischemia uh, on a clinically significant level. So I think it reinforces that ubiquitous use of any diagnostic test isn't really helpful, but if you see that truly equivocal moderate to severe lesion, uh, that would, as prior data uh, bears out, uh, be potentially of benefit. So this is just a bit of an interest. And then the um, influenza vaccination MI trial, which is the last one I'm going to present, um, is uh, present, presented by a Swedish group, the Sweet, uh, Swedish Heart Lung Foundation. Um, and I think is a very interesting and practical trial that we should consider, especially as we face this age of uh, vaccine hesitancy, um, albeit this is an influenza vaccine. So they wanted to test um, if Early influenza vaccination, i.e. within 72 hours of PCI for an MI or high-risk coronary disease, would have any benefit on CV events. So they were able to enroll about uh, 2,500 patients. Um, they only achieved about 58% of target enrollment because um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, enrollment was, as, was paused. Um, patient characteristics, about 18% uh, were women median age was 60 years, and the primary endpoint was all-cause death, MI, or stent thrombosis. Um, which was um, uh, dramatically reduced in a statistically significant fashion in the influenza uh, vaccine group, 5.3% versus 7.2%. So what does this mean? Um, and if you look at a rate of all-cause death, uh, rate of CV death and rate of MI as secondary outcomes, um, individually weren't, success, uh, weren't uh, statistically significant, but as a composite were. So the bottom line here um, is that uh, in... Patients uh, that receive influenza vaccination within 72 hours of angiography or PCI um, with a recent MI, um, you have a lower outcome of all-cause death, MI, or stent thrombosis. So those are the four tri um, five trials I wanted to present. Um, so we kind of talked about STOPDAP2 ACS, master DAP in the context of the existing evidence of dual antiplatelet therapy durations. And the main takeaway there was that longer durations may be associated with bleeding. If you want to go for a shorter duration, i.e. one month or three months, consider a more potent P2Y12 
rather than perhaps a less potent one in Plavix. Uh, and then uh, we talked about the Tomahawk trial, uh, which uh, was interesting in that regard that uh, all comers with cardiac arrest without ST elevations don't necessarily uh, benefit from uh, routine angiography. Um, and that was framed in the context of the COAC trial. Uh, Ripcord told us that indiscriminate physiologic testing in lesions that were technically in the mild range did not yield to um, better hospital cost and utilization. And then finally, the influenza vaccine in MI trial tells us that we consistently think about antiplatelets and statins and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, but a very another simple measure on a population level that would be of benefit is considering just a flu vaccine. Um, so I think that's a bit of a novel and interesting approach. So um, thank you, Dr. Stadnik and Dr. Chong, uh, for allowing us the opportunity to present. I hope uh, that this was useful um, for uh, the group. Thank you, Zishan, um, and thank you for your patience this morning with the uh, with the technical issues. Uh, some have definitely become apparent, uh, which we will address going forward. Um, uh, I have um, a couple questions, um, but perhaps um, if Dr. Chong is still with us, which I think he is, I'm not sure if if you have any comments first on Young. Yep, um, actually, thanks, Paul. Uh, letting me comment first. So, uh, as usual, um, Zishan, very well timed, um, 30 minutes exactly, and also very thoughtful interpretation of the data. A couple of comments only. Um, as with the antiplatelet trials, I think um, there is a there should be a move away from just the stent. Um, as you can see from the Japanese trial, 97% of them had intravascular imaging, something that we don't do as often enough. Um, so you, you, one can surmise that, you know, the stent would be almost perfect in those um, patients. So as you mentioned, um, they didn't do a routine uh, platelet testing. So the Derek studies will show that there is a large proportion of uh, East Asians um, that have um, clopidogrel resistance. So that throws something up in the air. Um, but it also makes me think of ACS as a slightly more than just blood flow. When you take into account more recent studies like the Colchicine studies, is more of an anti-inflammatory response that is also needed um, following the immediate restoration of blood flow. So that's one of the things that I think people have to start thinking about. Number two is the ripcord too. Now that's interesting, as I said that um, to you and a lot of your colleagues, that when you start indiscriminately doing tests, then you dilute out the benefits of those tests. And when you put the data from ripcord two, um, along with more recent trials, including ischemia. It tells you that you can use ischemia to target therapy, but when you start using it to then say, um, you know, these patients should be stented, these patients should, be, uh, should go bypass, then I think it's sort of, um, you know, underplay the disease process. Um, I was watching Nick Curzon very closely when he was um, explaining his rationale of carrying out ripcord, ripcord 2, and perhaps a ripcord 3 coming up, is that atheroma is what he's targeting rather than stenosis and ischemia because the disease process is more generalized. And that may be the one that changes outcome rather than just uh, treating ischemia itself. Great. That's all I've got to say. Um, I'll leave time for the rest. I think there was actually an interesting point that Dr. Golian had brought up, perhaps if you might have an interest in commenting, Dr. Chang. So, Dr. Golian says, what is a current recommendation post-PCI in a patient with complex versus type A lesion stenting and moderate risk of bleeding? So that's a good question, very thoughtful, and I think it really toes a line of equivocality. Um, I think a complex lesion uh, and moderate risk of bleeding uh, would favor perhaps, a, um, I think I would do an assessment with like a DAP score and, and perhaps more be in favor of prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy in that population. Versus a very simple, uh, stable lesion presenting in the context of stable coronary disease at moderate risk. Um, I mean, the guidelines give us enough leeway to be kind of as low as three months and as kind of high as six months uh, versus 12 months. I don't know if a type A lesion that's PCI'd with a moderate risk of bleeding should be indiscriminately subject to 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy as perhaps has been standard practice. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Dr. Chong. I would agree with that. Um, as I said, you know, it's you should look at the lesion and the patient as um, Murad is um, trying to hint. Um, 
I think that's as much as the evidence will tell us. We haven't been that granular in detail into individualized, which I think uh, a lot of people are trying to do now. Right, right. Uh, um, sorry, I just, I'm just going to interrupt briefly here. Um, I think Dr. Labanez has a question. Um, just because I'm trying to figure out the nuances of this platform. Marino, could you try and unmute yourself to ask your question, please? Okay, doesn't sound like it's working if you can't. Um... Uh, can we ask that you raise your hand first, Dr. Labanez? Well, it, it says, oh, we can see Dr. Labanez's hand, but. Um... Okay, perfect. So I've allowed your mic, Dr. Labanez. Now you just unmute yourself and you should be good to go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, so Zisha, an interesting presentation. This duration of DAP is a, a fascinating problem, right? Mm. I, I struggle with these underpowered trials, right? They, they're they totally underpowered for the uh, examination of rare events like stem thrombosis, right? So how do you reconcile these short duration trials where we have, you know, Pegasus, 10,000, 12,000 patients, no, 17, uh, many thousands of patients, and we have DAP trial, which is also 9,000. So we have like 27, 28,000 patients in those dura long duration trials showing benefit. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the longer you expose people to bleeding things, they're going to bleed more, right? But you're going to miss these ischemic benefits. The other thing is that people forget to use PPIs. I mean, there's a cogent trial that clearly show that you reduce GI bleeding by over 50% if you give concomitant uh, protein pump inhibitors. So these small trials, um, I think, are muddying the waters, and I wish they'd stop doing them. <laughs> I agree, Dr. Lavanaz. I think there's a couple of interesting things to think about, as you said. Um, you know, some of these trials consistently look at the high bleeding risk patient, um, which is the case for Twilight and also this uh, stop dap 2 acs trial. Um, and I think the other thing to consider, so that's one variable. The second variable is the choice of antiplatelet, so something potent um, like Ticaragol or Prasipro, and perhaps something less potent such as Plavix in comparison. And then duration, I think Dr. Chan had asked a question about one month versus three months. And then the overall features consistent with um, kind of high risk or benefit um, of uh, prolonged therapy in reducing ischemic complications such as stent thrombosis. So uh, the points I think that you had made is like the DAP2 trial and Pegasus, prolonged antiplatelet therapy um, patients. Uh, oh, so there's another question from Dr. Philip. So, I mean, I think it's tough to navigate this with a number of different variables. Um, and a lot of the uh, variables such as, um, for example, stent length or clinical factors that would influence you to put someone on prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy also are factored into those patients that are high bleeding risk. So I don't really know uh, what the best answer is. I think it's a thoughtful individual clinical application of the evidence uh, to look at the patient's overall bleeding risk, uh, to understand the lesion subset that was stented, uh, and then paying attention to the uh, choice of antiplatelet agent. Um, so perhaps, you know, in a patient that's at high bleeding risk and has a simple type A lesion and it's a short stent, um, you might be able to get away with a low potency PTY12. Uh, whereas in a patient that has a low bleeding risk but a type C lesion might benefit from prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor. Um, so I don't know if there's a one-size-fits-all, but I think all are great points for us to consider. Um, yeah, I'm not uh, sure if, if I could if I could add as well. I mean, um, if you look at the stop dap, um, is a post piece is a stent trial, whereas the other one is an ACS trial. So not necessarily or every patient has received a stent in Pegasus, for example. So I think, again, I always um, struggle to make people understand that um, when you're treating ACS, the restoration of blood flow is only the initial aspect. It's subsequently what you do with the rest of the disease burden. So I think that's where the anti long -term, longer term um, antithrombotic therapy and intense statin therapy, those are the ones that will reduce your, your outcomes subsequently. But, you know, things, you know, pati uh, the patients that are recruited for stop tapped are stent the patient. So th this is a qu it's a quite a different question they're asking. Uh, Dr. Beanlands, do you have a comment? Uh, 
Yeah, I was going to say, you know, similar to Marino and and I saw John Fulop's comment as well. Um, like it is getting very confusing. Um, when it's short, when it's long, when, you know, three months, one year, three years and so on. Um, and so we're going to need help and guidance as per as per Dr. Fulop's comments. Yeah. Sure, I think points well taken. Um, I think uh, when we're just after the procedure, I think we're well positioned to be in view of the clinical risk factors and the angiographic risk factors to make those recommendations. And then if you add that further layer of kind of permutational complexity with people that have AFib or on anticoagulants, I think it becomes um, there's infinite permutations as to uh, different combinations and lengths and agents you can use. So um, I think uh, we're victims of uh, generous options and patient complexity. Um, it's very nuanced, for sure. Um, I think uh, Dr. Shamoon has a question, possibly about the same thing, but I have questions about Tomahawk and Ripcord as, as well. So maybe we can pass to Shamoon and then I'll come back to those. Yeah, I, I, I have more like a comment. I think that we all know what to do uh, that longer duration in non-bleeders if I have a patient who hasn't bled in a year and I have to think now about what to do at one year, it's an easier decision for the clinician than decide if a patient who had a stent two weeks ago, like I had recently a patient who had a stent two weeks ago and he fell, now he has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I think the, the question is how long is the best is actually easier than deciding when to, what's the minimum duration that I can get away with in bleeders. And I think I agree with uh, with Moreno that, you know, these trials are low numbers and all that, but it gives me a little bit of a safety net, a little bit of a feeling of reassurance that I need to know what the minimum duration is. And this is the struggle that I actually find more uh, of a headache for me to decide then what is the best duration in non players. That's my comment. To kind of add to that, Dr. Shimon, uh, Dr. Labanaz's earlier point about how most of these trials are, they're powered to assess bleeding risk, but I think significantly underpowered at assessing ischemic yeah. thrombotic risk. I think it, it further clouds judgment. I think it would be nice to have that, but the trouble with ischemic stent outcomes is that the event rates are so low, you would have, a, have to have a very large trial to be able to truly tease out the differences in ischemic outcomes and still be able to look at bleeding outcomes. That's my understanding, but I noticed that Dr. So has his hand up. Perhaps he has some comments. Hi, I mean, I, this is a big topic and certainly of contention. I think the bottom line is that we have to personalize the therapy for individuals. One of the things that came up in terms of the recent non-STEMI ESC guidelines was specifically to use the short DAP uh, or the precise DAP score. Um, so I think using something like that as a tool to see who are the high bleeding risk patients would be very important for us to say who are the at risk patients off the bat. But to be fair, um, we're trying to do a meta-analysis right now where we've looked at essentially applying that. And those same predictors are also people that, uh, th those same factors within that scale uh, score is also people that are at risk in terms of ischemic outcomes. So I think it begs for further studies in that specific area in terms of personalizing therapy for each individual. The point in terms of the difference between Pegasus and the DAP trial, um, when you look at this uh, meta-analysis by Pomerini and Lancet a couple of years ago, quite clearly what you see is that by having a longer duration of DAP, you prevent MIs, you prevent stem thrombosis, but it comes at a cause of actually increase all costs, uh, a trend towards all cause mortality, and for sure in terms of non-CV mortality. And I think that again emphasizes the point that, let's say in that ACS patient that you're gonna treat for a year, at that one year mark, you have to make some sort of decision in terms of what is that risk for that patient. And that has to be balanced with bleeding versus thrombotic risk. And the best tool we have right now is still the DAB score. But again, I think there could be refinements over time. Um, and certainly I think with the advent of precision medicine, uh, looking at patient demographics to angiographic findings to um, even in biochemical profiles, there are potentials to really personalize this on a much better basis than, than our existing tools. 
Um, and then I, I think the last comment in terms of all of these studies, I agree with Marino. It's just there's so many of these studies that are just convoluting the waters right now. And I think the problem is people are trying to sort of put one recipe for everyone. And I truly believe that doesn't work. It has to be an individualized therapy for, for specific patient subsets. Dr. Beanlands, did you have a, a couple more questions? Yeah, thanks, um, Ellie. Um, so on the cardiac arrest trial, um, uh, so I'm still a bit concerned, like you, you, you pointed out the concern about identifying the patients who are at greater risk. Did they do subset analysis on those with shockable rhythms, for example, um, uh, where you know most of us would think those are ischemic events and and early revascularization may be a benefit. Um, uh, did they did they do some sort of sub analysis on that? Um, and and I think you you raised some concerns about their approach. So uh, maybe some further comment on that. For sure. Um, so I think this is interesting and in layers on more information uh, when compared to just coact alone, which only included possible rhythms. Um, we know that in a purely shockable rhythm format, as in COACT, that uh, outcomes are equivalent between delayed angiography versus immediate angiography. Um, this trial had a clear kind of 50-50 um, composition of shockable and non-shockable rhythms. And then when they analyzed the primary composite outcome uh, along some pre-specified subgroups, it held uh, consistently. The thing about this trial was that if you, uh, they were in, in like the 550 patients that were enrolled, only really 40% of patients had a culprit lesion. So um, the, the point that I took away from this trial, and, and perhaps Dr. Chong, Dr. So, and, and Dr. Labanaz can, can also comment, um, is that indiscriminate use of angiography in a cardiac arrest patient um, doesn't necessarily yield better outcomes. And putting together COACT and Tomahawk together suggests that um, uh, Shockable rhythms in and of themselves don't lend themselves necessarily to a target lesion uh, that is a cause for that initial inciting arrest. That being said, I did like the thoughtful approach in the um, when the patient was randomized to delayed angiography arm. There was an allow a kind of an, an allotment that should this patient have concerning clinical features of ischemia um, or say a history um, preceding. Um, their clinical presentation that would suggest coronary disease or say biomarker elevation or shock uh, or subsequent ST elevations that that patient would immediately get in geography. And it was analyzed in an intention to treat uh, approach uh, and outcomes still remained fairly similar. There is a third trial as far as I know um, that is coming out looking at this population. I don't know necessarily the nuances of what that would study. Um, but again, perhaps lending the comments that Dr. Shaw had uh, mentioned about um, applying the evidence specifically to the patient. Um, I think if I'm on call and a patient comes in uh, and they've had a cardiac arrest, but on further history, I hear that they've been having a lot of chest pain, they have cardiac risk factors, just because they have they don't have ST elevations, I don't think is a reason to say, no, we're not going to cap you aspirin, coact, and tomahawk. I think the thoughtful clinician realizes the patient's uh, perspective and clinical course and high pretest, independent of that one data point, i.e. how they're presenting, um, and then preferentially take that patient for angiography, irrespective of ST elevation or not. Um, but that's kind of my, my perhaps, um, um, just uh, opinion as a fellow, but I'm not sure if my faculty have uh, some other thoughts to add. So watching his interview, uh, Dr. Dash himself, he makes two points. He goes, in these patients, um, the main driver for the poor outcomes are neurological. So treating the cardiovascular aspect is may not be of prime importance. And number two, he said he designed the trial so that we could be doctors. So if you think that is ischemic, the patient can still go to the cath lab. Right. Okay, that's that's insightful, and young. Thank you. And then my last question is on ripcord. Um, how many of the patients actually had imaging beforehand? Uh, I must say, I don't know. The full paper's not out yet. It's just from the ESC talk. Would you know, Dr. Chang? Uh, so, um, not not formally, but um, from the um, interviews with um, Nick Curzon, um, these are patients that have been selected that they are going to the cath lab anyway. 
So um, they have not had any non-invasive testing. Um, they are stable coronary artery disease and ACS, non uh, unstable in China and ACS patients that are already designated to go to the cath lab. And then any lesion that is greater than 30% gets a pressure wire. He is building on his previous group called one study, uh, which was a preliminary of this, that about 14, 15% of patients with 30% lesions have evidence of ischemia based on the FFR. The couple of things that I, um, I'll wait for the, the full paper, but there are a couple of things that um, is interesting about this paper. The grading of disease um, where the people criticizing that it's low risk, it's, it's a bit confusing because he graded it as anything that is above 70%. That is counted as one vessel disease. So if you have a 50 to 70 percent where most of us use FFR, then um, that was still count, um, counted as zero in his study. And if you have concomitant disease, so if I have one 70 percent and the other one say 60 percent, but FFR positive, um, if I treated the 70 percent, the quality of life of the patient would still have improved. Mm -hmm. So I I think. He, he, I know his mindset that he is, um, he's also the same, you know, his opinions are, you know, opi ischemia is one thing, but treating the disease as a whole um, is another, and that is where he thinks the endpoints will come from. So he is moving away from um, lesion specific uh, ischemic testing to um, evaluating the patient as a whole using, in fact, his being an interventional cardiologist, he's moved to, to more into CT and CT FFR now. Um, but he, in fact, came up in the interview and said that CT is where he thinks um, is far more useful in terms of managing the patient rather than managing the artery. Yeah, I think you could make the argument the other way there too. I mean, CT FFR is pretty lesion specific. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got a study showing that CT FFR has not changed outcomes either. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Zishan. Thanks so much, Dr. Uh, Thanks, Dr. Stadnik. Thank you. That was uh, excellent and excellent discussion. Um, I like the fact that we can now have a little bit of a dialogue um, with our microphones unmuted. I think that helps um, substantially. We're going to stop early today. Um, we don't have time to to present more, and and we will leave that for another day. But um, I'd like to thank uh, Zishan and and uh, Anyang um, uh, for presenting on on relatively short notice uh, this week and uh, allowing us to discuss these topics. Uh, clearly, there's there's a lot that we need to uh, to learn about. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you have any feedback about this new um, format, please uh, send me an email. Um, also, if you have any feedback regarding um, future topics, um, the schedule is set for the fall. However, we have um, numerous um, uh, spots to fill in the new year. So again, please send me an email um, and everyone have a good week. We'll see you next week. Um, and I just ask if the technical crew could please stay on the uh, line. Uh, there's a couple of things we need to talk about. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks again, Zichen. Awesome.